Good afternoon, everyone, uh, or Feskerma, if you are uh, joining us from Scotland. My name is Miko Cleland, and Alex is away on honeymoon. Uh, so uh, you have me, unfortunately, to guide you through our Find My Past Friday session. And today we're going to be focusing especially on Scottish records, whereas I'm, of course, only married to census records, and so you can always be sure you'll find me here on a Friday. Uh, we're going to talk about plenty of different things. I know we've got some questions that have already come in, but do keep firing in your questions on the Facebook page itself. Uh, send in your comments, say hello from wherever you are. Anything else, always happy to hear more. And uh, so we're going to learn about Scottish family history and more about the wonderful things that have been happening at Find My Past this week. So let's... Mika, you've forgotten that I'm here. Well, of course. <laughs> there's there's uh, the lovely and able Max Hamilton, which... <laughs> I assumed everyone knew. Was no, there. I only said that because there was a comment coming in from uh, Nick Hancock who said, Hi Miko and Max, if you're around. So just to confirm, I am here and I will be interrupting Miko as and when is necessary. Yes, I'm, I'm <laughs> looking straight at Max right now and I'm going to keep that gaze as much as possible just to make him feel as uncomfortable as possible as we go through all of this. And hopefully you don't feel too uncomfortable at home, uh, but maybe we should get started. So, first of all, perhaps let's talk about the new records that have been released this week on Farm My Past. So we have a bumper crop of Catholic records from New York and Baltimore. So some people may say, are these for me? I'm not sure, I haven't got any relatives from these places, but that's kind of the beauty of, of what we do. Any time, as I work in the licensing department, uh, when we're out there trying to uh, get records to go into Farm My Past, we go to archives, libraries, different licensors, and we negotiate with them, we sign deals and we publish these records. Sometimes they have to be scanned, they have to be transcribed, and we can have anything up to 30 or 50 different projects going at the same time, and they finish at different times, and then we release them. So this week, it's uh, the time of New York and Baltimore, and next week, who knows? It could be Wales, it could be uh, something from Northumberland, it could be more Scottish records. It's just a case of we'll get there eventually and we're getting round to as many as possible, but there are so many things in the pipeline, it just takes a bit of time to get through. But we're always listening to your suggestions of new records and if you find something great, we're always happy to hear. And uh, there are some really good record sets coming up. And on a secondary note, you'd be surprised how many records that initially you think have no use to you, that later on you come round and you're really grateful they're there. So I found a few records in say the Irish dog license registers that I had no idea I would have needed and I was very very happy that I could search them at the touch of a button maybe around about a year after they were released but because they were there they were ready for me to go so those are the great sets that we have here uh, perhaps I'm sure you may not be tuning in from the states and have uh, your ancestors from the US but you might well have some uncles aunts very distant ancestors that followed their path through to New York or to somewhere else in the States and you might find their descendants there. So they're still really, really useful records and we're the only place that you'll find these online. So that's a great thing. And don't forget also, we're the home of Scottish Catholic records. So perhaps you may have seen some Scottish Catholic records elsewhere on another website, uh, which you have to pay to view each record. With us, just a subscription. You can just fill your boots to your heart's content and there are more records coming in that collection. And those records that are on the way have never been seen before online. So keep your eyes peeled for that Scottish Catholic collection too, and many more Catholic registers and records coming from the rest of England and Wales as well. I'm just gonna quickly say hello to uh, Denise McKnight, uh, Karen Whiteheads, and also saying hello from NYC, we've got uh, Maria Severly. Wow, well Maria, hopefully uh, these records are useful to you then, and that's great that we've got someone from the other side of the pond, and. Uh, Welcome. Uh, it must be quite early for you, and uh, thanks for tuning in and spending your morning with us. And uh, so, great. Um, hopefully everyone's having fun. I think maybe we should have a look at some of these questions, Max? Yep. So there were questions that came in uh, earlier in the week, and I've uh, given them over to Miko to cast his expert eye over. Expert. It's a very risky term to use. <laughs> but, uh, so I'm going to pick out a few of them and said, if you have any more, keep asking and comment as well. Uh, I noticed a few of you uh, sort of lent a hand in the comments as well, which is really, really useful, really great. And uh, so the first one, we'll look, have a look at William Shaw. So you talked about your ancestor in Glasgow and trying to find your ancestors, knowing they were born in Glasgow, but not really being able to find a birth record. So when we think about Glasgow, and this applies to all kinds of uh, family history research when we're looking at big cities or areas that have changed 
over time, Glasgow grew quite rapidly in the Industrial Revolution and became very, very large very, very quickly. It actually became about twice the size it is now, uh, peaked at about 1930. But there are lots of places that you would think of as living in Glasgow if you were there, but in terms of registration districts and areas, they're not labelled as Glasgow. So we have to maybe get a map out and start looking and seeing what's around and, and seeing if there are maybe nearby entries that might be of interest. So um, I did that, I had a look through and I used this logic, started narrowing things down and then I noticed that Rosie Morrill had beaten me to it. So Rosie suggested someone in Blyswood which is an area in Glasgow and uh, I took a look at that record as well. Uh, I actually paid for some Scotland's People credits because I can't let a mystery go unanswered and took a look and so we find there he is on the 1st of May 1911 listed as illegitimate born to a Margaret Cooney who was a printer's machine feeder your ancestor so check the closest census first if you can in this case because the census took place in the 2nd of April and this record you know was the 1st of uh, May uh, we won't find him in the census but it may be useful to find siblings etc but you know, of course here we're going straight to the birth record. But that's your ancestor, so it looks like we've got a solution there. So that's a, a good start, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to take a look at that yourself. That record was on Scotland's People, uh, the, which is where you'll find these civil birth, marriage, and death records. Uh, another useful resource for Scottish uh, research. And uh, there we have uh, the person you're looking for. Case closed. <laughs> so um, maybe let's take a look at um, Lynn Worthy's hunt for her great-great-grandfather. So this is quite exciting. Um, initially, when looking at this question, so Lynn asked to find um, if she, her great-grandmother was the right great-grandmother that she had with the information that she'd got from a marriage and who she thought that she was looking for. Um, so she thought she was born around about the sort of early 1850s up to about 1856. Scottish civil registration started on the 1st of January 1855. And so if you're at that port period later, that's very exciting. There's all kinds of great stuff you can look at. And especially if your ancestors were born, married or died in 1855, the forms are much more thorough. We have, for example, if you're born in 1855, you'll see the order of birth of the child. Perhaps it's the third son of the couple. And you'll see all this extra detail. The same with deaths. You'll see two pages instead of one. Uh, which is really useful, but it was so detailed that they only did it for a year. So we have this tiny window trying to find things. If you have ancestors perhaps born a little earlier or later, look for their siblings and maybe you'll find that information in their birth, marriage or death certificates as well. But, um, took a look. I did a bit better though. I started taking a look for William Armour himself and using the information that we had. And so there is a hatter named William Armit in St. John's in Lanarkshire, which, as we saw before, is actually in Glasgow. So whereas it looks like it's in a different place, it's in the city of Glasgow. Um, can we maybe have a look in this magical, invisible thing that I'm sure is here right now? Oh, is it's this... not here just yet. Sorry, I was looking in the comments. Which, which picture are we getting up? Uh, oh, the magic's been ruined. William Armit's uh, uh, census record, 1851. Uh, 1851, yep. Yeah. Okie doke. So... As we can see here, hopefully, with the magic of television. Yeah, no, it's taking up the whole screen right now, okay, so you can so do what good. you want. So this is 493 Gallowgate Street. Uh, William's a hatter. He's born in 1819 in Edinburgh. Sarah Armit is there. Uh, we've got a Christina born in 1842, a Mary born in 1844, and a Sarah born in 1849, which lines things up with the siblings that you know. But that's not all. So Scotland was a hub of ingenuity and great creativity in the sort of 1800s and the Enlightenment was a great time for Scotland. But photography was a great hobby and some of the earliest photographs that exist come from Scotland, many from Edinburgh, some from places like Glasgow. So what would you do if I could say I've got something for you? I have a photograph of your great-great-grandparents' house. So that's quite cool. That's Gallowgate Street in Edinburgh. Uh, in Glasgow, I am sorry. Um, what a wonderful thing to look at. That's taken from, I think, around about 1868. So that's very close to the time that your ancestors were there. So we're probably looking at the same buildings. Uh, what a wonderful thing to find. However, we went a little bit further as well. So I used 
the hinting system on Far My Past uh, because it gave me a suggestion that I just couldn't leave alone and thought, well, let's just follow it through and then I'll confirm it and make sure. So I then went to the 1841 census, which suggested that maybe we have the younger William Armit in Edinburgh. I found William Armit in Edinburgh. Um, he's there uh, with his father. Uh, I've got his information. And uh, I found him in Shakespeare's Square, which no longer exists. However, um, we have some more things as well. So first, maybe let's look at that transcript. Have we seen the census transcript for 1841? Yeah, that's, I, I was one step ahead of you this time. Oh, good. Excellent. <laughs> okay. And we've got a bit of a photograph of Shakespeare's Square as well. It was sadly demolished in the 1860s. However, here's an 1858 photograph of Shakespeare's Square, because luckily it was where the Theatre Royal was. So that means we have this very early picture. Oh, I was going to say, I brought up an illustration of Shakespeare Square, but we have Theatre Royal photographs as well. So, Illustrations so. a little bit earlier, but we have them both. So we're getting even better. We're going one further. It's always great to look for some context of all the places that you look for. Streets, addresses, occupations. And in this case, we happen to have been exceptionally lucky with these kind of extra finds that can really help to pad out your family history. So I then thought, OK, Let's go back to some records, and again, I, I maybe use some Scotland's People credits because I got a bit too excited and couldn't let the investigation go cold. I wanted to find out what the father was doing, and just to make sure I had the right sort of things going on. I took a look, and I found it said that he was a tailor, which is good. However, on Find My Past, we have so many Scottish records that supplement the core records that you might find on somewhere like Scotland's People. So I then looked at our postal directories. I looked at Shakespeare Square, and lo and behold, have we got something mm -hmm. on the screen? Oh, look at this, Max is very, very on, on the ball. Um, when I've named them correctly, then it works out well. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have his entry in Gray's Directory of 1834 and 1835 as a tailor in Shakespeare Street. So we now know even the number of the house that he's at, which isn't displayed on the 1841 census. In terms of any kind of family history research, if you hop from record to record, you can really start to build a full picture. And so by using these extra records that fill in the gaps, we can really go somewhere with family history, and especially with Scottish family history, where although the core records are online, it's the other stuff that we really need to fill in the gaps with. And they come from all kinds of places at once. In Edinburgh, uh, we have a huge number of records that have been released by ourselves and more coming. Take a look at the Edinburgh Child Temperance Pledges in the Record Acres Ed. They're quite exciting. Those are children in the 1800s that promised that they wouldn't touch alcohol. And so uh, we have their names, we have their ages, we have where they're from. They were released uh, very recently. We have lots of census substitutes. Scotland is full of those early census substitutes. One of my favourites is one that I had a bit of a work on myself when I was doing the cleaning of these records, and it's the Tingwall Shetland uh, list of inhabitants. So if you take a look at that and search for any name you like, uh, maybe Mackay or Smith, anything you choose, and look at one of those people, and you'll see that we have a full household, even the children, in the 1700s, listed out, which is perfect, with their residents. And this is something that in England and Wales just doesn't exist. Scotland has some of the best records in the world, but a lot of them aren't online. So we have to use things like transcriptions from family history societies, of which we've got more signatures and more agreements with family history societies than anyone else. And uh, we're bringing these online at a rate of knots. And so you can take a look at these yourself. Only in the next few weeks, you'll see a huge collection of more records from around Edinburgh and the Lothians, uh, which will help you with births, baptisms, and deaths, burials, and there are many more collections as well on Find My Past 2 to take a look at. So do start hopping from one to the other and take a look and hopefully you'll fill in those gaps. Hopefully that was quite exciting for you and hopefully that means now you've got a little bit further in your family tree and more to investigate. So then start feeding in those other records and keep going. Yeah, that's fantastic. So we have, I think, some more questions. Okay, so we have here Ruth Mason. How often did Scotsmen use aliases in England? Um, she's got a crazy theory because the English wife name, places and dates line up before and after they lived in Scotland. So aliases can be a little bit of a personal thing. Perhaps someone might decide to change their name on their own. I wouldn't really say that there's a tradition or a pattern in terms of aliases. Uh, one thing that helped me when we were looking at the last case, we were looking at Lynn's Hunt, was the fact that Scots 
often have a, a very strong naming tradition and so you'll find names repeating through generations and through families which can help you give clues that they're related and also often they'll use a middle name which is really helpful because the middle name quite often is the mother's maiden name and that can really lead you to the right thing. Sometimes it's a grandparent's maiden name, something like that, or a grandparent's paternal name um, but it's really useful to keep adding in those and keep making notes of those to see if that can lead you anywhere further. But I would say it's probably uh, an individual thing. If other things line up, look for some more evidence. Look for things that can help you to tell the truth, to see if there's something there in that story. It sounds like you've already done quite a lot of bit of research and you can maybe lay things out and see if there's a logical case. There's something called the genealogical proof standard, which is a really big sort of gold star. And if you can say that you've adhered to those rules, then that means that you're doing very well and you can be a little more confident in your results. So I would say definitely lay it out, see what goes on, but there's not really a pattern of someone changing their name completely and it wouldn't be anything traditional. There's a lot of cases in Scotland maybe saying like Jean and Jesse and things can be moved around, Margaret, Maggie, but not really a complete change. So if it's similar maybe, but not if it's too far off the mark. So hopefully that helps too. Um, so uh, Nick, I've seen your comment about specific naming conversations to Scottish surnames. Um, the difference between Muck and Mac, uh, it's Gaelic. Um, it refers to sort of son of, and um, it's kind of like an English transliteration of these sort of things. So um, sometimes, especially as we look earlier through history, uh, when people are writing things down and literacy isn't as high as we can, sometimes things can slip back and forth. Um, I don't find very often that the Muck and Mac disappear and reappear. So usually you'll know if you're looking at the same family. I know there are plenty of McClellans and I've never found a connection to Clellans. It's the same way. They seem to be completely different families and uh, it's good to bear that in mind. But I would say that if you find a Muck and a Mac uh, and the name is fairly consistent and everything else matches, then I would really, really look at that record because that may well be the one. And it may be down to someone else writing things differently if they've been and asked to copy it down for someone else if they've written down what they've heard then they don't really know if they're looking at a Muck or a Mac especially if it's a less common name that they're not so used to. Uh, we have uh, Joe Burton, any records for ancestors who worked in the shipbuilding in industry? So Glasgow again was a hub of shipbuilding, lots and lots of things. I would say go to censuses, look and see people's occupations in there. We have trade union records that do cover things like iron moulders and uh, boiler makers and things like that which would be the sort of people you might expect to be working around um, the shipping industry and things like that so do take a look at the trade union records they tend to arrive at sort of early 1900s and uh, they can be really useful to fill in that gap at that point in the 1920s if you were in a profession you're in a trade uh, you were in a union it was just one of those things that everyone really sort of had and so it's really worth looking we have a uh, few different professions of trades in there, uh, professions of different occupations. It's one of those uh, big sort of meaning things. But take a look at those and also have a look at postal directories as well to see if that gives you a little bit about occupation. That'll give you some address you could take from the census as I did just earlier. And take a look at a few other records too. Some companies have their own records and they can be in local archives. I would say the University of Strathclyde has a lot of records of iron workers and iron working uh, and they have a collection in paper form at their university archive. So that's worth having a look at and investigating as well. And there are many other record collections that are still in paper form and still in archives and libraries. The Scottish Genealogy Society has transcribed a lot of records and so have many other local family history societies. Consult those as well. They're really, really useful and you can't go wrong with a Family History Society. These people live and breathe these names. They know so much about this. They're the people to go to and maybe talk a little more about and they might be able to give you a few clues about other records you might not have thought of. So that's a great place to look as well. Scotland has these wonderful records but sometimes we do have to go off-road a bit and we have to think about what's on paper form rather than being able to click a button and then seeing everything straight away. But that makes things all the sweeter when we get there. So that's not too much of a problem. I just while you're looking at that, um, someone's commented, which I'm going to absolutely butcher their name because it has two of those, three of those funny <laughs> accents over the top of it. So Amy Nee Thomas, that's not it at all, says, I have Neils in my family who changed from McNeil to Neil and other spellings of Neil, McNeil, MacNeil, MacNeil, but the I and the E swapped around, mm -hmm. changes in how many L's. 
Yeah, there were coal miners in the Lothians, but they all kept switching surnames. <laughs> I think um, quite often I found that uh, Mac can be dropped uh, if you have maybe ancestors coming over from Ireland. In the 1800s, there was a little bit of anti-Irish sentiment in some parts of the country. Uh, my own ancestors were McAfee, and they scottified their name to McPhee and then slipped in with everyone else without anyone noticing. So there's this kind of thing as well. So sometimes perhaps someone is uh, trying to uh, camouflage themselves to protect uh, or to just be a little bit more well-to-do. But uh, that's also an option and it can happen. It's just I said it said when we're looking at whole families, they don't tend to go back and forth over generations and generations. So if you can find them and prove it, that's brilliant. That's really cool. And um, hopefully there'll be many more records as well you can take a look at soon. So um, we have some more. Um, the best way of finding a potential ancestor when all you have is their name. Ah, well, um, hopefully you've got more than that. I guess if you've been working backwards, you must have a rough age or a, a location, even if it's just the country as a start. Um, I mean, Drummond is a very Scottish name, so I mean, that's a, a thing, and we can look at perhaps maps to see where those names are more common. But the problem with doing that sometimes is that although 99% of Drummonds might live in Ayrshire, that 1% of Drummonds might be the Drummonds that your family come from, and they're in Argyll. So it's a good pointer, but don't take that as fact. If there are still some records somewhere else, look at those as well. They're all really, really important. And so, you know, you really don't discount anything. I would start adding in everything that you know, look at things that we have. So when we're working backwards, if you have ascensors of any kind, look at the names of spouses, look at the names of parents, look at things, and just try and combine that Alexander Drummond with anything else. An occupation is great, uh, an address, uh, anything that works just to give you that little bit of a leg up. With just a name, it is gonna be quite hard. It's not impossible, but it is gonna be very hard. And so uh, you really need to find something else to drape that name over. So start maybe going forward with the record, the generation further forward that you might know more about and just work backwards to see if you can find more records about their parents and that might give you some more information to work with when you've got that name. And hopefully you're in a period where there's lots of records as well. If we're talking about maybe the 1600s, then that might be a lot harder than doing this in the 1800s. So take that into account as well. Hmm. Quite funny here, Ruth uh, Mason says, I have McIntosh, Macintosh, and Macintosh CK all in one record. Wow, <laughs> that just really shows exactly what we're talking about. Um, so we have a few, oh crikey, there's uh, quite a lot of um, other questions and details that have come through. Uh, I'm just taking a quick look. Um, so just while you're doing that, I just want to say hello to um, Susan Hudson, uh, Secretary of the Huddersfield Family History Society. Uh, and she said, thank you very much for the uh, promotion or shout out to, I can't remember something in the comments, but she was name checking you there, Miko. So I'm, I think you must, you must have crossed paths at some point. I, I do remember going to visit the Huddersfield Family History Society. It was a great afternoon. And uh, I love family history societies and all of them are really, really important. So wherever you are, even if you're not doing research in Scotland, you're researching anywhere else, go and see your local family history society. They have talks. They have record transcriptions that they can do. You can volunteer, you can help. There's all kinds of things you can do and uh, they're always great fun. Um, and in terms of that as well, there's maybe a little bit of a, I wouldn't call it a favor, but there's something great that I've been working on with a team of wonderful volunteers and maybe I need your help. So I've been helping to bring Scottish records to Far My Past and we've been working through lots and lots of records. And uh, I have some wonderful volunteers who have been helping out and uh, I've been uh, helping them with some extra Find My Pass subscription time. Uh, it's been fairly straightforward. It's really nice and easy. You'll get some records to transcribe and to shift around um, and then help to clean up these records and help to see them on the website. And then you can step back and say, I helped with this. And it's a really nice feeling. Some of the records they've just released were some that I've been cleaning and some that some other people have been doing. So it's been a, a great team effort. There's a lot of camaraderie. So if you're really interested in helping, if you like Scottish records or you like transcribing and working with records, then maybe drop us an email. So that's at asktheexpert at farmypass.com. Is that right, Max? That's correct. So send an email, address it to me, and Max will pass them along. And uh, hopefully you can come and join our wonderful team of uh, record cleaners and helpers 
and um, then you'll be able to see some more records and help to bring more Scottish records online even faster. So that's really, really good to do as well. It's really great to see um, all the tips that are coming through in the comments as well. So, um, and, and just sort of observations. So Elizabeth Ball has said, has anyone else noticed that a lot of the Scottish records have the wife's maiden name on them? It's so helpful. But she then asked, is it because they're married under that strange Scottish rule of living together without actual marrying? Does that so, ring any bells? Yes, uh, Scotland has quite a turbulent religious history. So when we look at church records in Scotland, there are lots of other churches. When you look online at the established church, many of your ancestors may not have married in the established church. They may have married in free churches or other different denominations. So you can look at there as well um, if you can't find marriage records. But also there was a Scottish tradition of common law marriage, which means that you would go home with your betrothed and start living with them. And that was it, you were married. Uh, the church weren't so keen on that because they didn't really get a look in. And so they decided to punish those people that they found doing that. And they would bring them up in something called the Kirk Sessions, which are books, almost like diaries of what happens in the day to day of the church uh, of that local area. So sometimes this will be where you'll find evidence of a marriage, even though there's no marriage certificate. So take a look at your local parish Kirk Sessions book. A lot of them are online. I think many of them are online on Family Search. But you have to go to a family history library to see them, to browse through. Uh, and when you do, uh, you can go through, look at the area and the time that your ancestors were around, and you might find them being punished. They had to pay a fine, and then their marriage would be legal. And that would mean that then everything was straight. So if you remember Rabbi Burns, the famous poet, uh, the only evidence of his marriage that exists is from the Kirk Sessions. So his famous wife, ever suffering for his uh, constant philandering, uh, was only married to him through this Kirk Sessions document. So we can see that there, and that gives you that little bit of extra evidence and shows you um, then that we do have a marriage. Sometimes, again, though, there is no document, but there are lots and lots of other churches to look at. So do remember to look at those as well. So that's a really good tip. Um, we have uh, a few other things to look at as well. So there are newspapers. We have a huge collection of newspapers and as we're owned by DC Thompson, which is a huge Scottish publisher, um, we have, as you can imagine, lots of Scottish newspapers. And uh, I think maybe I should uh, show why newspapers are so exciting uh, with a bit of an example. So uh, Max, are we ready? What's, 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 what would it be named? Uh, it would be <laughs> the uh, photograph of my great, great grandfather. Oh, okay, right, yes. So, do we have it? We have it. So, I don't know if you can spot a family resemblance, but this photograph is the only photograph I've ever found of my great, great grandfather, and it came from Scottish newspapers. Their obituaries are very, very full, very, very rich, and that was where I saw. I think maybe it's in the eyes, I'm not sure. But uh, that told me lots. Told me about his footballing career, I didn't really know about his wonderful tailoring career, which maybe I might have inherited a bit of a, an eye for uh, design from that kind of thing, and told me a little bit more about my family. So that was really, really useful, and our Scottish newspapers are great. And with these extra records that we can find and use uh, on Farm My Past and in archives and libraries for Scotland, and these wonderful, great records, we can go back even further and tell more stories, and that's what we're excited. So I don't know if you're very active on Twitter, anyone. I know I definitely am. I, I'm kind of a little bit addicted to it. But I remember the uh, Museum of English Rural Life were looking at, uh, they call them absolute units, and they were just uh, very big things, very exciting things. So I think I'd like to get in on that. So uh, Max, would you like to share my absolute unit? Oh yes, this is fantastic. <laughs> Do we have him? We have him. So another earlier ancestor, again, came from Scottish records, all kinds of things that we can find. And we can go this far back. So this is from the mid 1700s. Uh, my ancestor is uh, slightly more portly than I am, um, but this is from a collection of uh, curious characters that were drawn in the 1760s. And so I have, luckily, my ancestor there, and uh, I can see if I can see some family resemblance. Probably not as much as my great-great-grandfather, uh, but I'll do my best. I've got some Ferrero Rocher downstairs, and I will keep going, and hopefully maybe I'll get there eventually. And all of these come from looping together these Scottish records. So that is the biggest tip I can give. Take what you know, add more, and keep adding more. Look everywhere and keep broadening that net and look at every record you can. There are lots of browsable Scottish records on Farm My Past. There's a huge collection of Edinburgh marriages that go back to the 1500s and they're an indexed book 
that you can just search as a PDF search and then browse through the pages. And that's really, really useful. So do that. The same with other collections. And they're really great to take a look at too. Um, Sharon Bedard, who's actually watching from the... Um representing the Isle of Wight Family History Society. Fantastic. Hello, Sharon. She says, uh, saw the Scottish referee paper has been added. Uh, my Ayrshire Jenkins and my dad both played football, so it's very exciting. That's very strange. Okay. Um, my ancestors were Jenkins from Ayrshire. That's quite odd. Um, great. Um, fantastic. Scottish referee is very good. Uh, we mentioned my footballing ancestors. We may be related. Hi. Um, that's great. Uh, that's thrown me a little. Uh, maybe it really is some my information. Life. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, the Scottish referee is great. Uh, there was a bit of a thriving football scene or soccer, if you're joining us from the states, uh, in in the country. And I said I have a slight connection to it. And it's amazing how many people played in these smaller, lower leagues. And sometimes you might even find a team photograph and that kind of thing. Uh, so it's really, really useful. Um, and uh, that can help too. And there are also newspapers like The Stage, The Era, to tell you about the sort of acting careers of your ancestors and this kind of thing as well. These other different things that really make life, they're the colourful details you really want to see, and you're not ever going to find those in a birth certificate or a government record, and we find that colour in those newspapers. So always check the newspapers too, especially in places like Scotland, because we have coverage for every county in Scotland. There are stories, uh, another relative of mine uh, on the Isle of Arran, which is where a lot of my family are from, uh, my uh, relative was caught ri uh, rowing a boat on a Sunday and the local priest told him off and said, well, how dare you row a boat on a Sunday? This is a special day, you need to stop this. And uh, my uh, relative said, uh, uh, keep your nose out, I'm busy. And this was a very famous thing that was, was put in the paper, this angry letter that was sent back. And uh, so I have this information I wouldn't find anywhere else, and I found it from newspapers. And so this is the great stuff that we can find in these sorts of collections. And so, uh, again, check those as well as the records. Try and double up. Try and look at everything that you find in a newspaper in record collections too to see if you can get the story behind the document as well. There's lots and lots to go for. How are we doing for time, Max? So we've been going for 33 minutes. I see. I can talk for Scotland uh, rather than talking <laughs> for Britain. Uh, so I don't know how much we've got left and, and what we can do. What, what, what else have we got to cover? Um, so there's some very specific questions, some sort of brick wall questions that I'm afraid we're not going to be able to answer right now without being able to research. Uh, some good tips coming through from people. But I think we'll have a, one final shout out. If you have any questions for Miko, get them in. You've got the next couple of minutes. We can run until 10 past is absolutely fine. Um, and in the meantime, I'm going to read out. There's a couple of good tips that have come through. So mm -hmm. um, let's see. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Oh, actually, there's one that I sent through to you. See if you can pronounce that name because you're going to know. I don't have a clue. Um, At the very bottom there. It's a very dangerous game, isn't it, pronouncing names? Uh, me, of all people, um, understand the difficulty with having a name that no one can pronounce. <laughs> so I won't want to upset you. Okay, sorry, you won't this. turn that into a game. It's only because you, you open with the, with the greeting and everything. That's fine. Um, <laughs> I've been learning uh, Scots Gaelic. Uh, I'm just obviously, um, if you want to know anything about apples or um, where the bathroom is, let me know. Other than that, I'm not really giving me much help yet. So I, I won't want to, uh, to, to butcher anything and do terrible things with uh, anyone's name, said, especially with my own. Uh, but uh, <laughs> all these uh, different tips that are coming through look really, really great. Um, things like illegitimate children were noted on records, so they're really, really useful where they're there because they can tell you more. Um, uh, Scottish records said, are much more thorough than their English and Welsh counterparts when we look at uh, details in the civil registers, so that start in 1855, so you'll have a little bit more information than you would if you were in England or Wales. And uh, don't forget as well, there was lots of cross-border traffic, so if someone disappears, check in England and Wales as well. You know, there's a, a, quite a high chance maybe they've shipped a little bit lower and they've moved south of the border, as my own family did and as many, many others have as well. So, um, any more questions coming through? No, I think, I think we'll call it a day for through. today, but we have the Ask the Expert at findmypass.com email address. Uh, if you have any questions, and if, especially if they are the longer ones, which we're not going to be able to deal with right now on camera, get them through and we will absolutely have Miko back. I'll do my best. Will perhaps. we have you back? We'll have you back, won't we? Um, I'm sure. As long as I haven't broken anything, it's not that bad. 
No, I have. <laughs> <laughs> that you've been doing so well, so professional, so sick, and a couple of times I've accidentally played like a little video of some confetti exploding over you, but it's okay, don't worry about it. Adds to the excitement. <laughs> so he right. does add six. When's Max gonna make a mistake? <laughs> um, well, so, okay, there is actually a question that's just come through right yes. now from uh, Karen Allcoat. It says, uh, any apprentice papers for tailors in the 1870s? Oh, that, again, I would love those because they're my uh, ancestors. My great-great-grandfather was a tailor. He apprenticed. Look at guild uh, halls. Look at these uh, trades uh, halls and these places. There are many of them. So don't just look at Glasgow and Edinburgh. Uh, look at the nearest borough uh, and try and find that. So it may be Anderston. It may be... Um, uh, Dundee, it may be uh, Dunfermline, it could be anywhere. Um, and look at those and look at the trades that are there and the trade houses and then see if there's a tailor's trade. Uh, and then see, you'll find those records in those kind of places. Um, some of them have been donated to the local archives, so check their catalogues as well and see what you've got. There aren't so many online. Sometimes, again, if you Google and have a look at that nearest location, you may find that a trade house has done some indexing themselves or maybe someone else has done it. Um, but that will be the best place to look for that kind of thing. I'm quite excited that so many people have similar family history spots to me and that, that makes me feel that maybe uh, we've got an excuse to get records that I like and I can use, uh, which is a great thing. Um, so right, I've, I've just sent through two more questions and also uh, a mystery has been solved. Not a mystery, oh, sorry, I shouldn't refer to it as a mystery. Uh, <laughs> this viewer's name is pronounced Anya. Okay, fair so enough. Anya, and that was a uh, guest by, I'm not sure, applying to Chris, maybe possibly Chris Lang there, uh, guessing correctly the pronunciation. I feel uh, very grateful that I didn't attempt. I'm, I'm sure, I mean, we have an Aoife here, uh, and we have a few other um, Irish uh, Gaelic names, and so uh, I think it's, it's just better um, just to not embarrass yourself and just avoid... Uh, if possible. Uh, so, uh, um, so, yeah, so I put two more questions through and I think we'll have to call it a day after that. That's, that's fine, because okay. uh, I've pressed the wrong button and I've lost my Okay, I can just anyway. ask you. Um, so, so one of our regular viewers, Nicole Hassel. Hello, Nicole. She says, um, I have an ancestor who was known by an alias. Would they have been able to use it on travel documents or census records? Uh, I have seen, so one particular example, again, a, a relative, uh, I couldn't find them anywhere. They disappeared completely. I knew their name uh, was Mary Aline Wilshin, and I just didn't know where they'd gone. They just vanished. And I found a passenger list that said Mary Aline brackets Sunday Wilshin, and that was the thing that I found. So then I looked for Sunday Wilshin, and everything opened. It was wonderful. It was like a blessing. I, you can even look yourself for Sunday Wilshin. She's a, a film starlet of the twenties. Uh, there are lots of portraits and photographs of her. She was a BBC uh, radio producer for a while. Um, she actually took over the uh, India service from uh, George Orwell. Uh, all kinds of other different things. I found photographs. I found all the films she'd been in. She'd been in an Alfred Hitchcock film. All kinds of detail. And all of that came from an alias that was on a passenger list. So sometimes you can be lucky and you can find these things. Um, it, it varies. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a common thing to find, but it, it can be there. And I got examples for myself that it does happen so that's there uh, I think uh, that's quite a quite a difficult one but it's it's there uh, always remember when you're looking at passenger lists to look at the passenger list for where someone's arriving because people are more interested in people that arrive rather than when they're leaving countries tend to wave at them and say goodbye whereas when they're arriving they want to know exactly where they're from and what they're doing and that segues very nicely into the last question that we'll ask for today and that's this is one from your potential uh, relative, uh, Sharon Bedard, who says, are there any likely records for those moving from Ireland? And I presume she means to Scotland. At the, at the times we're looking at, uh, Ireland and Scotland uh, were the same country. Uh, they were all part of uh, the, the United Kingdom. And uh, that means there were no real records. People would just get on boats and just go across themselves and things. Between Northern Ireland and Western Scotland, it was almost like there was a motorway between the two. Uh, the amount of traffic was, was quite high and there were plenty of people who left, particularly in the troubled times in the mid-1800s to uh, the west of Scotland in particular as well and often to other places like Dundee and other areas from Ireland, particularly Northern Ireland. So there aren't really any specific records. We have perhaps the only record that survives of uh, people travelling between Britain and Ireland and that's in our very early passenger lists and they're from about the mid 1600s and we think they're Scots they're travelling from if I remember rightly it's Liverpool um, but I'm, you'd have to check 
but they are online. Maybe I'll send, I'll post a link later on. Uh, and it's about 200 names and maybe people going to live on the plantations in Northern Ireland. So we have some Scottish names and maybe that's that. But that is really all that exists uh, because it was just one country. So I think if we're rounding it off, because um, mm. I said I, I will stay all day and I think yeah, people I think will time. shout at me. Uh, so thank you very much for having me. Um, Scotland has some of the best records in the world. I've probably said to death. And um, it's really exciting if you get a chance to browse through them. Look at the ones on Farmer Past. Look at the ones that are elsewhere in archives at Family History Societies and look at what's coming. There are many more Scottish records coming. If you haven't found your ancestor now from Scotland, don't worry because there's still plenty more to come. And don't just look at those core records, look at the other records as well. Farmer Past is a great home for those other records. If you're lucky enough to have Scottish ancestors, then fantastic and you're you're in with a good crowd if you're not there's always whiskey so <laughs> do remember that uh, scotland is uh, always happy to receive you and uh, go and enjoy yourselves and uh, Hopefully you'll have a great weekend. Thanks very much. Yeah, and also I just want to quickly say uh, apologies for absolutely butchering your name on you. I've actually checked and I've had messages from people around the company in our Ireland office <laughs> and in our Scotland office going, what are you doing? Telling me how to say it. So apologies for that. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us. Uh, I think you'll agree that Miko's been fantastic. If you give us a thumbs up, that would be really good. I know it's a bit shameless to ask, but it's great. always good to get those likes so that more people can see this on Facebook. So thank you for joining us. And um, I think we'll say farewell. Take care.